welcome, welcome. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. He is here. Amen and hallelujah. I could never imagine a moment in my life when he is not here. I, I, I don't even need to sense his presence. I don't need to question his presence. I know that he is here because his word tells me that he is here. And that should give us great, great peace. And that was was in my spirit as I was coming in. I listened to Christmas carols again this week. And Silent Night was being sung. Actually, it was being played by uh, an orchestra. Uh, the London Symphony Orchestra was doing it. But the words sleep in heavenly peace were ringing in my spirit as I was coming in the parking lot to this evening. And I wonder how many of us really, truly sleep in heavenly peace. I know a lot of my friends and um, even I, I, I sometimes don't sleep in heavenly peace because I'm worried and fretting or I'm concerned. Now, there are, there are nights when I'm just praying. I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm concerned enough to pray, but I'm not fretting and worried, like wringing my hands. But I pray. But I'm able to go to sleep after that and sleep in that heavenly peace because I have prayed and I have made my petitions known to God and I have taken my burdens and I've casted them upon him and he is carrying my burdens. But so many of us go to bed at night with worries and troubles that weigh heavy on us. We need to get to that place where we cast our cares upon him. That's what he's asking. Give me your burdens. My burden, he says, is very light. Yours are heavier. Let me carry your burdens. And you carry mine, which is a light burden. Yeah, that's what God, he is wanting us to sleep in heavenly peace. I know as we come through these holiday times, people begin to be consumed with presents and money and do we have enough money to do this uh family coming in is the family going to get along you know or i'm going to be alone for christmas it's a very trying time for a lot of people what should be a joyous moment turns out to be one of strife and conflict but in the midst of that there is a jehovah shalom the god of peace who wants to step into every situation and allow you the, the great sublime ability to sleep in heavenly peace. So before you go to bed every night, whatever cares have come up in your day, I hope you're praying through the day about those cares, but especially when you lay down and everything is quiet and there's a, a stillness and a calm, Take a moment and cast your cares upon the Lord and say, God, I can't do it. And then ask him to give you that sweet peace in your sleep as you rest in him. He just doesn't want you to sleep. He wants you to rest in him. So that what was, that's what was in my spirit, was just wanting to sleep in heavenly peace. Amen. 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 So I have a study today called Christmas Presents. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E -E, Christmas Presents. And God showed me something about a, a psalmist uh, in Psalm 73. That, that one line uh, that, that Asaph is going to talk to us about. And what I'm going to share with you, this is a Christmas message out of Psalm 73. Now, it's a, it's a long story, but basically there's a, a man named Asaph who was a psalmist. And he was looking around seeing the prosperity of the wicked and the evil. He saw that they were, um, they had plenty to eat. They had plenty to, to, ha uh, to, to wear in their clothes. They, they were not caring about anything in the world. They were prideful and conceited, arrogant. They were very um, rough with people uh, outside of themselves. 
And Asaph, a very humble and righteous man, was looking at all this saying, "What, Lord, I am serving you. I love you and I am serving you. And yet I have nothing compared to these evil, wicked people. And he's, he's just lamenting this through the first part of the whole psalm. But halfway through the psalm, he says this, my feet would have slipped. I would have stumbled had I not gone to the sanctuary of God, to the house of God. He, he, here's what he said. I, I, I would have been, I would have like pulled my hair out. I would have been so distressed by what I was seeing if I had not come to the house of the Lord and met with God. If I had not come and brought this to the Lord and come to the presence of God, I would have stumbled and slipped. And I, he, he was angry and he was upset and frustrated. And I wonder how many of us in the world right now, in the church, are looking outside and seeing prosperity of people who don't go to church, who don't love God, who have rejected God, and they see them prospering, and they see them doing amazing things and having abundance. And then here we are, the poor little church mice who just have enough cheese to, to last the day, where we don't know, you know how we're going to pay the electric bill, or, or Lord, why can't I go on a great vacation like everybody else? This is the story of Asaph. And I believe it's the story of most of us. But here's what Asaph says at the end of that psalm. He says, the nearness of my God is my good. The nearness of my God is my good. And he says, I have made the Lord my refuge. So here's what he says. I saw the wickedness. I saw the prosperity and the abundance of the evil and wicked. He said, I would have stumbled had I not come to the house of God. Had I not met with God, I would have stumbled and been frustrated and angry. But then he said, I, I, I met with God. And being near with God was all he needed. Now the song goes on to say that he saw the end of the wicked. And basically... If the evil and wicked who've rejected God, if they're prospering right now, this is all they get. They, their end is sure, separated from God for all eternity. But for those of us who love God, that we might not have it all here, we get it all there. And that's what Asaph saw. But he says, the nearness of my God is my good. And I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of your works. That's what he says to God. The nearness of God is my good. So isn't that the perfect Christmas presence? P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, God's presence. Well, Asaph was way before his time, amen? So let me show you Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This is where we're beginning. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now, we all know what that means, God with us. Now, this was a, prob a promise spoken to King Ahaz at the time of Isaiah, and there was, a, uh, there was a great adversity in Judah at that moment. In the midst of this, this, this horrible time, God speaks a prophecy through Isaiah to King Ahaz, and in, it, it is a, a fulfilling of Judah's hope of what might come. But see, the Holy Spirit wasn't just speaking that promise to King Ahaz, through Isaiah, he was speaking to you and to me through Isaiah. The Holy Spirit was looking a thousand years ahead to a people who were in darkness, adversity, and calamity. They were looking at, at, the, at the time of Jesus' birth and then looking 2,000 years ahead to us. There was a message being delivered that there would be a, a child, a Messiah, who would be born. Now, ultimately, we know that that was fulfilled at Christmas, or what we call Christmas, when Jesus was born. Emmanuel, God with us. 
What a promise. But it's more than just simply a promise of God being in the flesh walking with us. Emmanuel with us becomes our very nature. It becomes who we are. Because I walk with Jesus, I am a certain way. I, I behave a certain way. I think a certain way. I speak a thir- certain way. I act a certain way. I serve and love because he is walking in me, around me, through me. And so Emmanuel is not just a promise. It's my very nature of who I've become in Jesus. It's God at peace with us. You see, in order for God to be able to walk with me, we have to be at peace one with another. Amos says, how can two agree? How can two walk together unless they agree? The fact that there is an Emmanuel, a God with us who can walk with me, means that I am at peace with God. That that will just spin my head like eight different ways that the God of all creation, the almighty God, is at peace with his daughter and can walk with me. It's also God's covenant with us. He says, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And we're going to talk about these scriptures and and get into some more scripture. But I'm just setting the stage. Asaph said, I'm in trouble, Lord. Psalms are, I'm in trouble, Lord. Here's what I need. I need to be near you. He had to go to the temple to be near God. We don't have to go to church to be near God. We don't have to go anywhere special because there is an Emmanuel, a God with us who makes it so that I don't have to look for him. I just am knowing that he is here. Now, amazingly, Emmanuel literally translates as the strong with us, the strong with us. That is the name of our Savior. His strength with us in every breath, in every moment, for all time, his strength is with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His strength, his presence is with us. And with the promise of his presence and the strength that comes with that and the revelation of his love and longing for us is overwhelming to my soul and my spirit. But just what is so amazing about this Emmanuel being with us, his presence being with us, let me show you. This, this is the message of Christmas. Amen? His presence gives us rest. His presence gives us rest. Exodus 33, 14. Exodus 33, 14. And he said, God said, this can't get any plainer. And God said, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. You see, that's why Jesus said, I have come that I can give you rest. I am the Emmanuel. My presence is here and it will go wherever you go. It will go with you and you will find rest. You don't have to labor on your own anymore. You don't have to struggle and strive after anything except pursuing the one who will give you rest. His presence gives us rest. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4. It says that his presence will fight with us or fight for us. Listen, Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. Jesus is with me as Emmanuel to fight my enemy. I only have one enemy, Satan. And Jesus said, I- I'm going with you. Wherever you go, uh, because I'm Emmanuel, because I came in the flesh, because I came to dwell with you, no matter where you go, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going with you in every battle. I'm going with you in every struggle. I'm going with you in every fight. And I will bring victory out of everything. That's Emmanuel. 
He says he'll never forsake us. His presence will never forsake us. His presence creates fellowship among believers. That's Zechariah 8. His presence blesses us. That's Genesis 26. He comes, his presence comes with us to deliver us. That's Jeremiah 1.8. He comes alongside of us to save us. That's Jeremiah 15, 20. Let me read that one for you. This is Jeremiah 15, 20. And I will make you to this people a fortified bronze wall, and they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you, says the Lord. Asaph. The nearness of God is my good. Oh, if we could just, just rest in that, that the nearness of God is our good, that we don't need anything else but to be near to God in every trouble, in every situation. Jeremiah 46 says his presence frees us from fear. There, perfect love casts out all fear. We don't have to fear anything because we know he's with us. Hebrews 13 says his presence is with us forever. That's he'll never leave you or forsake you. Psalm 46, his presence is a stronghold against the enemy. Here's what it says, Psalm 47, 46, verse 7. The Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Jehovah Sabaoth is the, the, the Hebrew name of God here. The Lord of the hosts. The hosts, the angelic messengers, the hosts of heaven. He's the Lord of them. He's the Lord of everything. And he is there as our refuge. You see, Emmanuel is not just his name. It's, it's a promise. It's a promise of intimacy. It's a promise of fellowship. It's a promise of peace and strength and safety and refuge. The psalmist Asaph. Boy, that psalm has sat in me for a lot of years. That one line, the nearness of my God is my good. The nearness of my God is my good. It's like something that I can hold on to knowing that there's a nearness of my God. We do not serve a God who is a statue somewhere that you have to rub his head for good luck. We don't have to face the east and pray three or four times a day to a deity that's far off. We, we don't have to uh, go to, to somebody to intercede for us, to mediate for us, Why? because he is here. I don't have to search him out. The picture of the shepherds at, in, at the birth of Christ is the perfect example of this. Shepherds, I always call them those crazy shepherds. I, I've never taught anything without, without, about them without calling them the crazy, because they're crazy. They left their livelihood, the sheep, behind because they saw an angel in, in a field as they were watching their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, Fear not, for unto you this day in the city of David has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And they said, Well, let's go see. Let, let's just go see this Savior. So they leave the sheep. They leave everything that they're responsible for, that they're obligated, obligated to take care of, and they go and they find the star over the little manger. And there they find the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who was born, Christ the King. But the shepherds weren't allowed in, in, in the city. You see, they were too filthy and too dirty. They were, um, they had, irrep um, they did not have a, a good reputation. They were considered the, 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 the lower part of society. Shepherds weren't even allowed to testify in court because they were considered so untrustworthy. They were considered the lowest part of society. 
Yet Jesus put himself in a place where the shepherds could find him. Where was that? In the manger. The only place a shepherd could ever find a king is in the manger. You see, that's what Asaph was saying. Uh, uh, the nearness of God is my good. The shepherds went and, the, and they were able to find Jesus, right? Like the, Jesus made himself available in the only place the shepherds could find him. You need Jesus in a hospital waiting room, he is there. You need Jesus in a funeral home, he's there. You need Jesus in your kitchen, he is there. You need Jesus in your school, well, He's there. They try not to keep him there, but he's there. Wherever you need Jesus, he is the Jehovah Shema. Ezekiel calls him the Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is there. He's here. He is here. He is here. He, can we just, he's here. And that's what Asaph was saying. That's what Isaiah was prophesying. That he, he, he's Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. That baby in the manger became the name which is above every other name. This baby Jesus. Let me just read these verses because they're so empowering and so uplifting. This is, they're, listen, we know these verses, but hear them. Let your spirit just soak it in and hear these scriptures fresh. Like you've only, there's like this is the first time you've ever heard them. Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And being found in appearance as a man, Emmanuel, God with us. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth and that the tongue, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, being found in appearance as a man, Emmanuel, God left his throne and came to this earth and took the appearance of the man. And we cannot lose sight of that. That the reason why Isaiah prophesied to King Ahaz and said, Listen, there is one coming. Whole, oh, there is one coming. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. God literally with us. What hope that gave Ahaz. What hope that must have given Isaiah. And so 2,000 years ago, in a little manger in the little city of Bethlehem, <laughs> Christ the King was born, became flesh, and dwelt among men. That's what First John, uh, John chapter 1 says, that he became flesh and dwelt among men. Why? So that he would be humbled one day, and that he would go to the cross and then on the cross, he would deliver a victorious blow to the enemy, to the enemy, Satan. And he would rise up victorious. And then he would send the Holy Spirit to be living inside of us and dwelling inside of us. So that the very name of Jesus causes everything to bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. There is, listen, cancer bows, heart disease bows, divorce bows, hate bows to the name. Those are just names. Hate is a name of an emotion. Divorce is a name of conflict and crisis and anger and unforgiveness, disease, death. It all bows. Why? Because he's Emmanuel. And he is here to cause those things to bow in our lives. Oh, saints. Christmas began in the heart of God. Uh, this whole idea of sending a son began in the heart of God. But it's only complete when we receive 
Emmanuel. You see, it began in his heart to send Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, in the flesh to us. But we have to receive Emmanuel in order for him to live in us. We have to receive him into our hearts. It began in the heart of God, but it ends in the heart of man. It's based on the exchanging of gifts. See, this is what Christmas is all about. God gave a gift to us, his son, in the flesh, Emmanuel. And our gift to God is receiving him into our heart. I give him my heart in exchange for his son. Lord, I would have stumbled when I see the things around me that are going on. This is what Asaph said. I would have fallen and stumbled. I would have slipped, but I came into your presence and really discovered that the nearness of God is my good. Saints, draw near to him, and he will draw nigh unto you. These scriptures are flying. They're not even written on my notes. They're just flying through my spirit and my head right now. He wants that relationship with you. He is longing to allow for you to allow him to enter in your heart. He wants you, especially this is the best time of year. If you do not know this Emmanuel, will you let us lead him to you? Because God really is just desiring a life with you. His presence in you, through you, to fill you. Oh, it's such a beautiful picture. And he's painting it one brushstroke at a time. God bless you, saints.